Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and this video covers Longstreet's recovery and him going back into the field as the commander of the First Corps once again. The Longstreet's would spend the summer around Augusta in Athens, Georgia, staying with family and visiting friends. Despite his leave, he still communicated with Robert E. Lee. In one letter, Lee wrote, you will soon be as well as ever, and we shall all be rejoiced at your return. You must not, however, be over impatient at the gradual progress you must necessarily make, but be content with the steady advance you are making to health and strength. Your programs will be more certain and your recovery more confirmed. Do not let Sherman capture you, and I will endeavor to hold Grant till you come. Our enemy is very cautious, and he has become so proficient in entrenching that he seems to march with a system already prepared. By mid-September, Longstreet boarded a train for Richmond, and Louise and the children traveled to Lynchburg. The general still didn't have use of his right arm, and carried it in a sling. He also couldn't ride his horse, however by the end of the month, he was able to mount his new horse, Fly by Night, a gift sent to him by General Lee while he was in Georgia. Longstreet would officially take command of his first corps on October 19th. As he rode by his troops, the men all along the entrenchments began to cheer, referring to him as the old bull of the woods. A party was held in the general's honor, welcoming him back to the ranks. When Longstreet returned, he dealt with a lot of personnel changes to his staff. Many men were transferred to other generals or transferred out of the state, but the worst loss to Longstreet was Moxley Sorrell. The young man was promoted to Brigadier General and given command of a brigade in A.P. Hill's Corps. As Longstreet settled into his duties as commander of the 1st Corps, he basically commanded all forces north of the James River in the defense of Richmond and Petersburg. Ulysses S. Grant continued to extend his lines west and south to cut the Confederate Army off from the rest of the Confederacy and deny it much needed supplies and what reinforcements could be had. Aside from an offensive operation at the end of October, both armies remained in their entrenchments and sharpshooters played havoc on the poor soldiers who dared to peer over the parapets. Longstreet remained at his headquarters nursing his partially paralyzed arm and dealing with the hemorrhaging of soldiers from the ranks. On New Year's Day, he wrote to Lee, I believe that we are now better able to cope with Grant now than we ever have been, if we will profit by our experience and exert ourselves properly in improving our organizations. A month later, he wrote to Lee that he could not hold his line with the amount of men that he possessed, but added, We shall fight him, of course, as long as we have a man, but we should fight with much better heart if we could have hope of results. In these last few months of the siege of Richmond and Petersburg, debate swirled about the merits of authorizing the use of slaves as soldiers with the Pledge of Freedom for their service. Lee asked Longstreet's opinion, but the Lieutenant General opposed the idea because it would mean the necessity of abolishing slavery in the future without materially aiding us in the present. However, he did ask Ewell to raise a company of slaves in Richmond to be tested as soldiers. Despite their effort, Lee was already drawing up retreat routes from Richmond and Petersburg. At the end of February, a letter came through the lines from Union Major General Edward Ord wanting to meet with Longstreet and discuss prisoners of war and fraternization between their troops. The two generals met, but during their meeting, Ord requested a side interview. Ord stated that since the politicians had failed to bring an end to the hostilities, it was up to the army officers. Ord was referring to the meeting between Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens and United States President Abraham Lincoln aboard the River Queen at Hampton Roads that failed in its mission. Ord wanted a suspension of hostilities for Lee and Grant to meet and an exchange of visits between Louise Longstreet and Julia Grant, two old friends. Longstreet explained that he had no authority to do so, but would mention it to Lee. That night, Longstreet, Lee, Davis, and John C. Breckinridge discussed what Ord had put forward, and they seemed receptive. Longstreet met with Ord a second time, and it was decided for Lee to communicate with Grant. On March 2nd, Lee wrote a letter offering to meet with Grant and discuss the end of the war. Grant wrote back that he didn't have the authority to discuss political matters, that that was the purview of the President of the United States. His matters were simply military. On March 25th, Lee launched his last offensive with an attack on Fort Stedman. Although the Confederates gained some moderate success in the beginning of the attack, the lack of troops and Union reinforcements rushing to the area prevented the rebels from succeeding. On April 1st, Longstreet's friend George Pickett was embarrassed at the Battle of Five Forks when his division was routed while he attended a shad bake. 
The grip of Ulysses S. Grant was tightening around the Confederacy, and it was only a matter of time before it would gasp its final breath. With the defeat at Five Forks, Lee telegraphed Longstreet to come at once with Field's division to Petersburg. Longstreet moved immediately, pulling his troops out of their defenses and instructing General Ewell to fill the vacant entrenchments with local defensive troops. Longstreet and the division crossed the James River on a pontoon bridge and arrived at Lee's headquarters on April 2nd at daylight. Lee was unwell when Longstreet entered the home that acted as the commanding general's headquarters. A.P. Hill was also there, getting instructions from Lee. The commander was unwell as he explained how he would secure the lines to the southwest, but as they talked, the roar of musketry could be heard in the distance. Word came to the three generals that the far right of their line was being attacked and driven in. Hill rode off in the direction of the sounds of battle to shore up his lines and restore order to the chaos that was the Confederate lines. As Longstreet examined the lines, one of Hill's aides came to him with word that Hill had been killed. Later that day, Lee telegraphed Jefferson Davis in Richmond that I see no prospect of doing more than holding our position here until night. I am not certain that I can do that. Miraculously, Lee's troops held on until night. The Confederate government, including the president, boarded trains out of the city and much of Richmond was set ablaze. Longstreet formed up his first corps and that of the third corps since A.P. Hill had been killed and began their march west, out of the confines of the fortifications that had been their home since June of the previous year. The capital was burning and the prospects of victory looked dim as Longstreet and his troops marched along the roads leaving the city.